All right, welcome to the last part of the topic. We talk about ligand substitution here, okay? If you still remember from the previous video, we talk about different ligands, different strength, and different energy gap. So the stronger ligand will cause a bigger gap. A weaker ligand is a smaller gap. So different energy gaps will actually result in different absorption and different reflection. Therefore, different complexes with different ligand appear as different color. All right. So in this case, we talk about ligand substitutions. Example, again, my favorite metal ions, which is copper. Okay. So let's say I had started with copper H2O6. And that's the usual copper solutions with a blue color. Okay. So a blue solution. Now what will happen if I add concentrated ammonia okay now initially copper with water as a ligand now i'm adding another types of ligand here which is ammonia or amines they name it as amine so what will happen if i add concentrated meaning excess so when i add concentrated of ammonia the ammonia will tends to substitute the water and resulting in this still 2 plus but the color will change from blue into dark blue okay so this is a typical example of ligand substitutions from water it changes into ammonia because you add extra ammonia now can this reaction go backward as in can i change the dark blue back into a blue of course you just need to add water Okay, so when you add excess of water, there's no concentration, so excess of water, what will happen? The ammonia will be substituted by water and you get CuH2O6 complex ion, then you turn back into blue. All right, that's one example. Now, what if from this ammonia, I add concentrated HCl? Now, in this case, it's not straightforward. I add HCl. Which one do you think is the ligand? Obviously, the Cl minus, right? Because it has a low pair. So what will happen is it results in copper Cl4, 2 minus. Okay? And because the ligand changes, you will get a different color. So what is the color expected to change from dark blue into... yellow, green, okay? Because change of ligand, you expect a color change, all right? So can I change this back into dark blue? Yes, of course, you just need to add concentrated ammonia, okay? So can I change the blue straight into yellow green? Yes, same thing, you just need to add Concentrated HCl. Okay, you change with that. And if you want to change back to blue, you just need to add excess of water. Okay, now this process, the changing color is due to this ligand substitution. Of course, this is just one example out of all. Okay, so uh, we take corporate example, it can be chromium, it can be iron, it can be a changes of uh, water into cyano, it can be a cyano into water or Cl or Br, so any changes is possible. Okay, and we don't have to remember that. And uh, in exam, the type of questions they will ask will just be like, uh, they give you the ligand and give you the strength of the ligand and they ask you if a stronger ligand take place. If a stronger ligand substitutes a complex ions, what is the color that you expect to change? Now come back to the same thing like what we learned from the previous video. If I have a stronger ligand, okay, let's see. Uh, we start with the example here. Let's say I have copper again. We have copper here. H2O6, octahedral, 2 plus. 
started with blue. Okay, let's say I have this. And then I substitute it with a stronger ligand. Let's say ammonia. All right, stronger ligand. All right, so if this is a stronger ligand, this is just an example. Huh? So if this is a stronger ligand, and what will happen to the gap? Now, initially, the d orbitals will split as usual because it's octahedral. Two on top, three below. All right. So if I to labor it, you should be able to do that. Dx square, y square, and dz square. And that's these two are the one that having repulsions with the ligand when it comes into the octahedral shape. And these three will be dxy, dyz, dxz. Now, uh, regardless of the sequence, uh, you can put any one first. Now, water ligand will produce this energy gap. Let's just call it as E1. Okay. Now, now I'm using ammonia, which is a stronger ligand. And then I will get a, another complex, which is NH3, 6, 2 plus. And what will happen to the splitting? The d orbital will still split into 2 and 3 because they maintain as octahedral shape. All right. And then here is the gap caused by ammonia, which is E2. All right. So what do you think? Ammonia is a stronger ligand. So E2, the gap, will be more than E1. Make sense? So if E2 is bigger, which means they will absorb lower lambda, lower wavelength light. Okay, E1 will absorb higher wavelength light. Okay, now if they absorb lower wavelength light, example, violet or blue, the expecting color that we observe physically, the appearance, because they absorb purple and blue, we will not see purple blue. So what is the color being absorbed? Either you check the data booklet for the color view, okay, for the wavelength, if specific wavelength is given. If not, you can still estimate them. If they absorb lower lambda, they will reflect high lambda. Which means if they absorb violet, most probably they will appear as red. Okay, the two extreme. All right, now let's say E1, the smaller gap, they absorb higher wavelength. So if we want to estimate, they will reflect low wavelength. Example, if they absorb orange yellow. Okay, probably they will appear as blue or green. You get what I mean? So this is this is how it looks like. So when you have a color uh, spectrum, so if they absorb on one end, which is the violet, it will appear as the other end, which is the red. So this is just an estimation. Okay, this is just an estimation. So to be accurate, we have to refer to the data booklet for the proper specific wavelength and the specific color being absorbed and what is the complementary colors being reflected. All right, so we still have to refer to the data booklet and that's it for ligand substitution and this is how it works. So you just need to know why they change color because of ligand change and why ligand change they result in change color because of all this, the one that I just explained. Okay, the strength, the gap, and different wavelength being absorbed and being reflected. All right, so this is ligand substitutions. Next, move on. This is the last part, which is transition metal can act as a catalyst. Now, we learned that in SAM 1, homogeneous catalyst and heterogeneous catalyst. Okay, now catalysts usually are transition metals. Why transition metal suitable as a catalyst? Because number one, Okay, they can have different oxidation states and thus can easily transfer electrons. Okay, this is usually meant for homogeneous catalysts.
all right the next one they provide catalytic site for reacting molecules to be held in place for the reaction to occur this is actually referring to heterogeneous catalysts Now, why they can provide a catalytic site? What is that catalytic site? This catalytic site actually referring to the incomplete d orbitals. All right. For example, I have a d orbitals like um, iron. All right. So iron should be uh, two plus, let's say, and. Uh, what is the 3D electron? 3D electron should be 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right. 6 electrons. Okay. Now, we have empty space here, obviously, because 3D6, we still can put in 1, 2, 3, 4. We can put in 4 extra electrons. Now, that is how the catalytic site works. So let's look at the diagrams later. So how does it work as a catalytic site, right? Okay, let's for example here. This is a reaction between hydrogen gas and ethene, all right? Now, we can see that both actually start absorbing on the surface. I'm going to explain that again, whatever we learned in SAM1, adsorption. So they try to stick onto the surface. Now, how they actually stick onto the surface? They use their extra electrons. This is supposed to be a double bond, all right? They use the extra double bond electrons to form a temporary bond with the surface, with the metal surface. Like for example, if this is actually iron, okay? If this is actually iron. So what will happen is the electrons from the carbon here, the extra electrons, they will go into the d orbitals of the ion. So remember, the d orbital should be incomplete. Okay, so you have space here. You have room for electrons. So they form a temporary bond. Same goes to hydrogen. They break the bond, original bond, and they use the electron to form a temporary bond with the ion, where the 3d orbitals are actually incomplete. All right, and there you go, the process happens. So because they are closer to each other now, they start interacting with each other, and then they start forming new bonds. And after that, they release out from the surface. And this process called desorption. All right, so this is for heterogeneous catalyst where you have a metal surface on it. Next one is <clears throat> homogeneous catalyst. Now, go back just now. We talk about homogeneous catalyst means they have different oxidation states can easily transfer electrons okay how does it work we explained that in sam1 as well so let's go through it again now for example you have a reactions between per sulfate and iodide to form sulfate and iodine okay now obviously per sulfate is going to be reduced iodine is going to be oxidized all right, so what will happen is the catalyst used in this case is iron ions, okay? So iron ions, it can be two plus, it can be three plus. So let's say we started up with two plus. So what happened is we know that, sorry, we know that the per sulfate is going to be reduced. So when you put Fe2 plus in, the two plus will get oxy, oxidized. Okay, how they get oxidized, for example, this one is get reduced. So Fe2 plus will donate one electron to the per sulfate in order for it to get reduced. And Fe2 plus in turn become Fe3 plus because oxidized after donating an electrons. Okay, now once they have turned into Fe3 plus, this Fe3 plus is going to catalyze another reactant which is I minus. I minus is going to be oxidized here. So to be oxidized it needs to release electrons and these electrons will be accepted by the Fe3 plus and there you get Fe2 plus. So you get reduction here. The release electrons accepted by Fe3 plus 
change into Fe2+. Now the whole process is Fe2+, starts with donating electrons. Later on, the second reaction, they accept electrons. So end up, you are getting back your Fe2+. So catalysts remain unchanged at the end of the reactions. They just act as an electron carrier. They can either donate electron first and then accept later, or they accept electron first and donate later in two separate reactions. So that is how heterogeneous catalysts work. A homogeneous catalyst, sorry, this is homogeneous. Okay. So yeah, that's all for the topic. And this is the last video. So hope you can understand whatever I explained in uh, the remaining uh, the previous videos. So if anything wrong or anything you're not sure, please feel free to ask. Okay. Thank you.